Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Amy Terlaga. I am from Bibliomation, a Connecticut consortium. Bibliomation is sponsoring the Zoom session. Closed captioning is being sponsored by Equinox Open Library Initiative. We'd like to thank our captioner. Uh, again, this is in meeting mode, not webinar mode. Um, so please leave your video off and your mic off when you aren't asking a question. I'm very happy to introduce Chris Sharp. Chris is the system administrator of the Pines Consortium. For the next two hours, Chris will be presenting Understanding Evergreen Reports. So Chris, uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. I appreciate it. Um, I guess we'll dive right in. I'm, I'm going to post a link in chat that will be to a Google document uh, that uh, has some information, sort of a, a, an outline of the session. Um, and I'm sharing my screen here with a presentation. Um, we will be you may see this address on the slide that says uh, csharpmaster.gapines.org. If you want to follow along and don't have access to your own test server, that is available for you. And there are logins available on the second page of that shared document I just put the link to. Um, if you have any trouble accessing that, just, just speak up and I'll, um, I'll be able to do it. And, and I, I don't remember whether Amy just said this, but uh, the way I train, I like it to be somewhat interactive. Um, so feel free to ask questions. Um, by unmuting and asking or by um, uh, posting something in chat and I'll just, you know, if somebody sees a, a chat message that I need to see, please just speak up. Okay. Um, all right. So evergreen reports, I was trying to think of an apt metaphor for this and I'm a jigsaw puzzle fan. Um, and so with a jigsaw puzzle, you take a box and you dump the puzzle onto the table and it's a whole bunch of pieces that you have to then reassemble into the picture that you want to create. And evergreen reports can feel like a giant stack of jigsaw puzzles. Basically, you are, you know, <laughs> you're trying to make a bunch of different things happen um, and then you have all the pieces mixed up. Uh, it, it, it can be very confusing because the way we think of the things we do every day um, is not the same as the way you need to think of things for reporting, which I think is why we have such a large number of people attending this session because, you know, it's complicated. So I'm reusing a little bit of documentation. I'm pretty sure that this handout was used in my uh, presentation last year at, or uh, yeah, at, um, in Pennsylvania. And this, um, I've reused this uh, slide share before too. So anyway, Let's start with what we know. Um, I, think, I think all of us have worked with spreadsheets. Um, and spreadsheets are nice tools to have because everything's organized into columns and rows. And if you have, a, a, if you know that your data is in column C, uh, row three, that, that locates that column for you, that bit of information, that bit of data that you need um, is, is entered there. And so if we were to just naively start a, I don't know, let's, let's just say a record store, you typically don't store, I mean, there's, I guess there's some record stores that store customer information, but usually that's not what's going on. But let's pretend that, that we do want to store our customer's information at the record store. Um, and their favorite albums and things like that. So you might be tempted to start using a spreadsheet for that. So uh, I'm going to change what I'm sharing here to illustrate. Okay, sorry, I have too many dang windows open. Let's see, where is this? So this is LibreOffice, which is an open source equivalent to Microsoft Excel. Um, so let's say that we wanted to have a um, customer 
database, you know, a, a record of our customers. So you might have the kinds of fields that you'd associate with a customer. You might say, you know, first name, and then last name, and then uh, address, and then, you know, phone. Obviously, you get more detailed than that. But you're already seeing that to record this data in a computer means you're going to have to enter this customer information, you know, for every customer that comes in. So let's say that you, you've got a customer and I'm at my address and my phone number. And then, well, my wife comes in and decides to buy a, a record as well. And she lives at the same address and has the same phone number. And then my son comes in. Oops. You're starting to get the point, right? So there's repeated data. This is a problem. And there is really not a great way around repeated data when you're using a spreadsheet. Um, you know, again, with the music that, that customers like to like to do and in, in honor of Amy, I will have like the, uh, let's see, we'll do the artist and album. So we'll have Wilco being there or AM or one of the other older Wilco albums that I've been getting into. I'm working chronologically through their music from Uncle Tupelo Ford. Um, so to match which customer bought the album, how do we do that? Well, you can say, you know, Chris Sharp bought that. And then, well, another customer came in and bought that. And you continue repeating data and there's not a great way to do it. So how do you link customers with music? Well, that's when the data has become three dimensional enough to consider using a database. You know, spreadsheets do work and I'm sure you at your libraries have lots of weird, crazy spreadsheets that you're managing things with. But with database skills, you can actually do a lot more. Um, so in a database situation, we would have a customer, in this case, it wouldn't be a, a spreadsheet, but it'd be a table. Let's, let's call it a table. Another word is relation. That's a technical term. But so for customers, again, you know, first name, last name, address, phone, email, whatever. Okay. Whoops. But we also... We want to have something that identifies the customer uniquely. So what a database does is it assigns an ID number and it's just sequential. And the first row gets one and the second row gets two and the third one gets three. And eventually you have, you know, if our store is successful, we have thousands of customers. Um, so what this does is rather than I'm not going to retype it all out for you. So rather than having to put each customer's name in the music table, we can do this. We can say customer one bought this and customer three bought that. And what that's doing is it's taking the ID from the customer table and you're referring to it from the music table. And this is what music would probably be its own table and then there'd be a purchases table. But you're getting the idea. This constitutes a link between the customer and the music. But we don't have to write the customer every time. So if I buy another album, I'm really dating myself with my music choices, I know. Let's say that I buy another album Boom, 
I don't have to put Chris Sharp and address and all that stuff because I can refer to it. And instead of having to retype the address every time, I can have the address in a separate table and on. And basically that creates a situation where you decide where can repeating data happen? This is called normalizing a database. Where can repeating data happen? And if it can happen, it probably needs to be in its own table somewhere. Um, so that's basically how you come up with the problem that a database solves. Now, let's move to things that we work with day to day in libraries. And let me reshare. Okay. So we work with books, right? And we all know what a book is. Like nobody needs to explain what a book is. We also don't have to really think hard about what attributes a book has, like, I don't know, title, right? Or author. If this were an in-person session, I would have you shout things out. I think that'd be chaos across all these microphones. But basically, what I usually hear is barcode, call number, because you're librarians and that's what you think. But like, you know, everyone, even non-librarians can tell you the attributes of a book. You know, even it has a blue color cover and it's by James Patterson. Like, you know, people know that. So there's also money. In the libraries, we take library fines. You know, some of that's getting phased out, but you know, I think lost, lost and damaged fees are, are here to stay. So we're gonna keep, you know, receiving money. And so we need a way to deal with money. And then of course, the people who come into the library, the users, the patrons, you know, we call them patrons, but there's also staff users. And so there are different attributes of those users. So the users are, you know, they have a first, middle, last name. They live at a location. They have a phone number or email address. They, um, and then, you know, um, you have the circulations themselves. So let's, let's take a look at the book. As I said, you've got the different attributes and really this is where I call on the catalogers in my normal trainings. And they usually say things like pagination, and they say publication year, and they say, so th those are the bibliographic elements of the book. But there's also the physical elements of the book and the actual instance of the book that exists on your shelf. You're already working in an abstract world where you're having to remember this uh, metadata that describes these books. And with a patron, same thing. You've got their date of birth. You've got their driver's license number, if possible. You've got their parent guardian. You've got their uh, physical location. And then finally, you have a situation where you have to track what your patrons are doing. So circulations so, or hold requests or things like that. So a circulation, which we don't typically think, think of as a thing, like it is not a real, you can look at a book, you can look at money, you can look at a person, you can look at a building, you can't look at a circulation, but we have to track it somehow. So circulations exist in a table and hold requests exist in a table and transits exist in a table. But you know, in real life, we don't really think about a transit. We know that, for instance, the t-shirts I ordered from Land's End are on the way here. We, we don't think about that being a thing, we think about the t-shirts. So, but to be able to track it in software, you have to be able to quantify it in a certain way. So the reason that I'm going through all this is that it takes a lot of uh, different data sources to store and then to store this information for retrieval. So for instance, for a book, these are table, names, these, these are not actually the table names, but let's just say there's the copy of the book, the actual instance of the book that's sitting on your shelf or is in your hand at the desk. The call number volume, we're already getting a little more abstract here. The volume, as catalogers know in Evergreen, is sort of an intermediate holding object that the copy belongs to and that it itself belongs to the bibliographic record. The bib record is where all of your title information is, the pagination description, all of the, the descriptive things that let you find the book are in the bibliographic record. 
And then of course, metadata for searching is not just in the bib record, which is usually in Evergreen is stored in Mark XML, but you know, often it's in Mark 21, which is like not even a format you can read. Um, so you, you know, you have to pull that data out of the, the format it's in and make it available. So that it sort of explodes all of the um, attributes of the book that you're looking for or whatever it is you're looking for into a form that allows search. And then of course we talked about circulation. So we have to track about what the book does. Who, who's got it right now? What is the status of the book? Uh, have, are there any holds or rec hold requests for this title? Have, has this particular copy that's in my hand been targeted for a hold? Um, so as I say, not actual table names. Again, we talked about transits. Shelving locations, that's another part of the book that you have to consider is where in the library physically does it live. Um, circulation modifiers, that's something we use in Pines a lot, but really, you know, that, that lets you set your circulation and hold rules around a particular item type. The owning library and or the circulation library, and we'll see that when we get a little deeper that those aren't always the same things. And then users. So these are all the different tables that go into describing the physical object of the book. And the thing that, the reason it's important to understand this is that reports has to pull all of those data pieces back into something that you recognize. So again, this is the big pile of, of uh, I, I always slip and say crossword puzzle jigsaw puzzle pieces just laying all over the table. And you have to decide like which box to pull from and which pieces do I need to complete the picture I'm trying to create. And the way we do that is by joining database tables together. Now I'm gonna switch back to my spreadsheet for a second. Okay, so back here, the way we join these tables together is by a linkage between an ID that is then referred to in another table. And then, you know, these, also have IDs. So Wilco would have one. This is actually the transaction table, but you get my meaning. So one, two, three, pretend these are different albums. Now, when the ID belongs to its own table, that is what's called a primary key. Now, the primary key doesn't have to be an ID, but let's just for the sake of argument say that's what it is right now. Um, this ID number means nothing on its own. It is just a serial number. But once it's been assigned, in this case to REM Green, that's REM Green's ID number inside your, your database from there to eternity. It is unique and no other, like all REM Green should be associated with that ID number. Same with customer. Now you have your primary key on one table and then when you refer to another table's primary key, that's called a foreign key. Now, we're getting into SQL concepts, and, and we are going to talk a bit about SQL, which, or SQL, as some people say. I, I say it out. Uh, I say the letters. doesn't matter. Potato, potato. Um, when you're referring to the other table, it's a foreign key. When you're referring to your own row, it's a primary key. So those are important examples. Those are how we link, keep using that word link, and I, I want to put a slide of the Legend of Zelda link in here, but I have not gotten around to doing that. I'm a Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild fan. So, but that's what these are, chain links, and we use a select query to join tables together. So the, what you do with a select query with SQL, it's a very simple, very easy to read language. 
that's used for database uh, manipulation. In this case, we're only concerned with select. There's also update and delete and insert and things like that. But we are just talking about select because that's all the reporter is doing. It's not changing any, any data. It's just pulling data that you want to see. So you, you decide what you want to see. And by what you want to see, you're deciding what fields do I want in my report. From wherever these fields need to come from. So if you need something about a book, there's a copy table that has some of the information. There's the call number table that has some of the information. There's the bib record that has some of the information. So you have to pull from different sources. Join one or more sources on foreign key relationships. So what I mean by that is what I just illustrated. The foreign key is another table's primary key that's referred to in your uh, join. So, and then where? So if you do select what you wanna see from this table and not put anywhere, any sort of filter on there, you're gonna get everything. <laughs> you need limits. And if you're like, I work in Pines where we've been running this for, you know, gosh, uh, almost 14 years. So, you know, there's lots and lots and lots of data. You definitely don't want it all. And then there's another type of filtering called having, uh, which is called an aggregate filter. And that, that gets a little more advanced. We may get to it today, but we'll see. Okay, so this is, um, it's now called display fields, not displayed fields. This is a correspondence between the SQL select query and what you actually see in the reporter interface, which we're gonna to get to in a minute. Okay, so these are display fields is the select. From wherever you're getting the stuff is, is your data source. Where is the filters and having is another type of filters. That used to mean more in the old interface. Okay, I think that's the end of my slideshow. So I'm gonna stop that. We're going to look at client. If I can find that one. I can. Okay. So again, C sharp c sharp dash master dot dot org slash eg slash staff and you can use one of the logins that I provided for you. I created my own user on here. Um, but uh, any of those logins will work or you can use your own system. Um, and hang on, I forgot to do something. Is that showing too? Is it you watching me type? Yeah, sure. Oh. oh, that's cool. Okay, see, we use Google. Like, I, I'm, I'm finding there are subtle differences between all of these um, online meeting services. With Google, it just does a single window. This is actually showing this. So, good. I hope, I'm glad nothing embarrassing was on my screen. Okay, let's do this. That's how you start the reporter. All right, we're back. Um, so we're inside the, the SAP client. There are several, there, there are a couple of different ways to get to the reports module. You can click here for reports, or you can go to administration and click reports. It goes, it does exactly the same thing. And if you're logged in as a user that can run reports, and we'll talk about permissions, um, you should see you are logged in as your actual username. And then it will show you these icons here. Um, let's see. Oh, darn me. Okay. Let, let me just let me sidetrack into permissions for a second. Um, <clears throat> you need a couple of different permissions to be able to use reports fully. Um, one of them is run reports, and that just means you can run a report template that someone else has created. Um, the, uh, 
Oh, it, I'm sorry for making everybody's uh, full screen every time I change something. No, I, I, I have the same complaint. Um, <clears throat> where was I? Sorry. Oh, temp per permissions. Um, there is also create report template, and that's a permission that you need to have to be able to use reports. And it used to just be run reports and anybody could be able to do that. Um, but it, it's actually better to break them out for several reasons, but one of them is security. Honestly, it's like, I, I think, you know, we, we lived in a kind of naive bubble for the last, you know, 15 years or so until, I don't know, maybe last five years, we've gotten more and more aware of cyber threats um, and the possibility that people can use this wonderful, beautiful software we've all created for evil intent. And, you know, there are, you don't want to widely give permission for just anybody to run reports or just anybody to create reports templates uh, because it, it gives them the ability to report out personally identifying information. We, I was having an argument with my colleagues just yesterday about you know, how, how are we gonna deal, like a, we had a, a staff member actually send a, a report result that contained patron names and addresses to the uh, shared Pines list. It was, a, it was a mistake, she didn't mean to do that. But, you know, when we saw that, I was very alarmed and thought, oh, well, maybe we should consider having a policy of not putting patron names on reports unless you just need it. You know, this is just their sort of standard weekly circ report that had everybody's name on it. So there's stuff like that you have to think about when, when assigning permissions. So uh, run reports is one permission and create reports template is another permission. And you have to have both of those to be able to do all the things we're talking about today. Um, so anyway, just I'll, I'll hop off my soapbox on that one. Um, so if you're visiting this for the first time, your my folders are going to look like my shared folders here, which I know is confusing. Um, so really, this is a sheet of paper icon, but it actually designates a folder. And I know that there's a usability issue there. Um, so the um, way you create a folder is you can click on the name templates and you have to have subfolders like you can't just start creating stuff um, without without an actual folder that belongs to templates that belongs to reports and belongs to outputs. so i already have one in here but i'm, I'm going to do another i'm just going to call it training whatever um, you have an option to share or not share uh, by default it does not share uh, share reports uh, folder is actually another permission too, and that's something where you can set the depth. Um, we in Pines only allow sharing within a library system. We don't allow sharing across library systems through the whole consortium because reports for us is already a gigantic mess and we don't want to make it worse. Um, but you can share with the people that you can share with. Um, and then once you've said you do want to share, you can designate you know, consortium, consortium system branch or, or other. Uh, and then you just create subfolder and it should pop up with this action succeeded. Okay. Uh, and now when I look under here, I have the original one that I did share and that's why it says cons there, that's consortium. Um, there's also a training subfolder that I just created and you need somewhere to store your report. So let me back up a second. You're already a little bit confused when you open this because it says my folders and shared folders and the use of my and your and our or whatever in software can always be confusing but my folders means your own folders like the folders that I have control over that I can make sense of. Um, shared folders will be where other people's reports folders that they have shared pop up they'll pop up in this list. So you may already see shared folder. If you're on my server, you'll see my C sharp folder sitting there. They don't have anything in them yet. Um, but you need, so with templates, a reports template, well, I usually ask, what is a template? And I don't know, somebody answer, what's a template? Like in general, not, not reports necessarily. like a form or a, a blank form, an outline, a basic form, a pre-made form to copy. Yes, perfect. Yeah, prototype, those are great. 
great uh, ways to think of this. So when you create a reports template, you are pre-configuring everything you can so that all you do when you actually run the report is to put the data in, okay? So that's what templates are. And really that's where we're gonna spend a lot of our time today uh, is talking about templates. Um, but you have to, just in the way we have to store circulations that happen, we have to, we have to store reports um, where you take the template and you stick the data in, that object needs to be saved somewhere. And that's what reports is. So that's a little confusing to have a folder called reports after you've entered what you're calling reports. It's just something, it's a confusing thing right off the bat. In any case, um, I already have my C-sharp folder, but I can click on the name reports and then it will pre-populate with what I just used. I can set my sharing things again and, and put create subfolder there. And again, so when you run your report, you end up with reports output. And that's what this third folder is. And I'm gonna create a folder like that. Now this, this sort of three tiered, making the same folder for each one, that can be very clarifying. Um, I am a person who thinks pretty linearly when it comes to this sort of thing. Um, if you're sort of a pack rat and you have, unfortunately there's now this search option at the top that lets you find templates that other people have created. But um, if you're more of a pack rat type, you might just have randomly named template folders without consistently named reports folders and consistently named output folders. I would recommend while you're beginning to prevent unnecessary confusion to just create this sort of three tiered structure that I've done here. Um, so, what do we do now that we've created our template folder? Uh, we will click on cons. You know what? I'm going to do something else. Let's see. All right, so this is for real just to illustrate running a report real quick and then we'll create a template. All right, let's see. Let's look at a template I've created recently. I don't like those, I'm gonna pick a different one. Let's just do a quick, uh, looking this. Sorry, I actually did have something prepared for this, but I changed my mind midstream, sorry. Um, let's do this, let's do, this is our action trigger report, I'll just run that. So it doesn't really matter what it is. So what you do is once you've got reports, you see what a mess my folders are, I was just preaching to you about folders. Um, what you do here is you select where your template is, in this case I selected a little further down. By the way, you can keep creating subfolders as many deep as you want. Again, I would just for simplicity's sake resist the urge to do that. Um, so I clicked on MISC, which is uh, under C Sharp Shared, which is under Templates. Um, so I am going to do the Action Trigger Events V2. So I put a checkbox there. It is by default, it assumes you want to run the report you've selected. So I will then put in a report name. Okay, and I can put in a report description. And then you can get into pivot data. We're not gonna worry about that right now. Um, we can talk about it if you want to later, but it's not a priority. So I've got my report folder that I'm gonna store this in. And I selected Chris. And I've got my selected output folder here at the bottom, which I selected Chris as well, again, for consistency. And then here I have a couple of just forms that I'm filled out so that, you know, like I said, it's a template, we're just sticking our data in. So let's see, this is our action trigger report. So we'll look at the ones that ran yesterday. So between yesterday and yesterday, you can make it further, but basically um, you can also with this, that's a real date, 
you can also select relative date, which lets you run it X days ago in this case. The re there is a way you can change this from days to uh, months or whatever as well. We can talk about that if you want to. Um, at this point, there's not a way to change it, but you can create your template in such a way that it, that's allowed. Um, it gives you output options. By default, Excel, HTML, and bar charts are selected. Uh, if this is going to go to like you know your web person to put on a web page, they may want it in CSV rather than these other outputs. Um, there's also recurring reports. So if I click this and I keep it at one day, this report's going to run every day. Now, and it is actually true that we run this report every day, but I don't want this to run every day right now. But you can set this to run every one day. Um, or you can set it to up to, I guess, 24 days. Um, I'm not sure why they only have it 24 days. But anyway, um, you can do every week, every two weeks, every month, every 12 months. You know, if, if, if you're forecasting out that far that, you know, OK, our annual reports run and you're not having to think about it, they'll just automatically come into your inbox. Um, so. If your, recur if your report is recurring, it's important that you do select relative date curve because if you do a real date, what's going to happen is it just reports June 9th every single time you run the report, and that's not what you want. Um, run as soon as possible. That's usually what you want when you're just running a report. But if, and what that'll do is like it's now 12.37 p.m. Eastern, and if I just say run report as soon as possible, it will run today at 12.37 and the next day at 12.37 and the next day at 12.37. And that may not be the most convenient time for me to receive that report. So I can actually set a time for it to come to me, um, including times in the past. So like if this were a monthly report, I can set this to the first of the month and I want it to run at noon or midnight. Uh, a lot of your system administrators will appreciate it if you run your reports overnight that are not urgent. Um, so, you know, you can pick 2 a.m. It'll just come in 2 a.m. on the 1st of June. I walk in the door on the 1st into my office when COVID-19 is over and sit down and there's my report, okay? Um, and like I said, putting it in the past, that might seem a little weird, but the way the report scheduler works is it finds the oldest report in the list and puts it first. Um, so that's that's... That's what makes this possible. So that way you don't have to have like, okay, I forgot to start my report on the 1st and now it's the 10th. So if I run this monthly, it's gonna run June 10th at 1237 p.m. And I don't want that to happen. So this is the way you solve that problem. It also lets you get the data that you want now and not wait till the 1st of July. So anyway, there you go. Now email addresses. This email is uh, pulled from the Evergreen account from the person who is running the report. You can add addresses. So this would be my coworker Don's address. You can do it, you can separate by space. Uh, you can separate by um, a comma or semicolon. The, the system will do it correctly. Okay, we got a quick question. If you start your run on the first, will it run 10 reports? No, it will run one report. That That is a great question. Um, it, you know, I haven't experimented a lot with that, but it doesn't, it'll just run once and it recurs from then on out. Weird. I don't even know if I've tried that. So feel free, try it. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. That's interesting. Um, so I have all of my fields filled in. Um, I actually don't want this to recur. This is just a test report. So the way, and I've got my report name, my useful description. Um, and another thing to know about these, and I'll, I'll show you in a second. Um, I'll just hit save, save report, it says action succeeded. Now, what now? How do I know whether it's running or not? Unfortunately, you don't. There's not really a way to know. You can click on output and click your output folder. And it looks like mine is sitting here in a pending state. Um, So you don't really know. You can keep clicking this to see if it's going to move. I wonder why it's taking so long.
Okay, well, let's pretend that this blah blah report here is what actually ran. So you to view report act output, you can click this, click, make sure that's done with view report output and click submit. That will open a new window that will then have your totals. Um, now notice that my, it's blah blah actually, my report title is visible on this. And if I put in a description on this blah blah report, it would actually show here. And I'd say that so that, um, I say that so that it's uh, clear to you that if you get cuter than, you know, blah, blah, and you start writing other four letter words, or I hate my coworker so much for making me run this report, or whatever it is you're feeling at that moment, this is not the place to voice your frustration. <laughs> so, because anybody can see this, anybody with reports, um, anybody with run, no, it's view report output. That's the other permission I forgot view report output permission can see these reports. And that's basically all staff for us anyway at Pox. Um, so I'm gonna close that off. Um, all right, so yeah, you mentioned that that's still set for June 1st, 2020. See, that should be running though, because that's in the past. Let me reset this. Oh, it ran, okay. I, it must've been waiting. There might've been a queue. Um, and that's another thing you can you can configure how many reports can run at a time. So let's let's view the report I just created. View report output. Okay. So here I am. It says my title. It has my useful description, and then it has this bar chart which was automatically formed. It's not particularly useful. I think it does let you know your report worked without having to dig any further. Um, Oh, it will? Oh, Don, Don corrected me. It will run 10 reports. Oh, wow, okay. So, please warn your system administrator before you do that. Okay, so tabular output um, is the HTML output. And what this will do is just, it's got this nice visible table and you can just sort of click on that and see your results without having to open up an Excel file. Now, if it's one of those massive, like, 67,000 row spreadsheets, you probably don't want to do this. It'll just, you know, it'll, it'll freeze your browser up trying to load all the data in. But this shows the, uh, the fields I chose, and it's a useful report that we get every day that lets us know how many notices were sent the day before. Um, so that's tabular output. Excel output, in my case, opens in LibreOffice. So I'm running Linux and that's what I have installed. And that puts it in Excel so that you can, um, you can edit it, you can clean it up and make it beautiful for your coworkers or your board or your director, or do you know, statistics. Like you know, if, if you edit this, you can use the built-in sum function to see how many that was total. Uh, this is the sort of thing that like, Heinz libraries in the past really wanted Evergreen to do all of it. Uh, the fact that you can take this raw data and stick it into a program that is built for statistical manipulation, like Excel or LibreOffice Calc, there is no reason for Evergreen to reinvent the wheel. So if, if you're ever in that argument with your libraries, tell them that they need to go to an Excel training, because really that's, that's the way that that should work. Okay, so let me get back to my window. All right, so the third link here is debugging info, and I'm not gonna go into that yet. We'll go into that a little bit later. So we have now successfully gotten into the interface and we have run a report uh, so that we can sort of see how that process works. Are there any questions before we move on to creating a template? I'll pause for a couple minutes, a minute or so. Okie doke. All right, your template folders aren't that, oh, well, yeah, I, I, it's all, it's all a, a matter of um, relativity when it comes to messiness. Uh, my wife is a professional organizer and every, every house she's gone in, the person was like, oh my God, I'm so messy. And she's seen like real squalor before and it's just, you know, anyway, 
yeah, we all we all think our closets are messy until uh, somebody else sees our our closet. It's like, wow, you're really neat. Okay, all right. So we're back to my C# -sharp master server, so we don't disturb the the poor Pines libraries who are waiting for reports to run. Um, so um, to create a template, um, well, first of all, before I jump into that, let's talk about like existing templates. Uh, so this again is, this is Pines production. So um, you're getting a view into what this looks like for us. And, and that's, that's probably a good thing for y'all to be able to see. So if I'm in shared folders now, I can actually see other people's stuff. Um, so we have, uh, these are GPLS staff folders and then like some odd cataloger folder that should not exist here. But for instance, this is the admin users folder. So we, years and years and years ago, there were some templates created by the original developers at MicroLender and, and people like that to accommodate some Pines needs. And that's where these are stored. Um, and then there were some that Equinox delivered us, I don't know, about a decade ago. So, I, you know, that's another thing is with reports, depending on what upgrades do to your database, reports can sometimes break. Uh, like existing reports can change because the schema underneath it changes. And that's not a bad thing per se, but report, you know, creating reports templates is such a bear that people get really panicked about that if it does happen. Um, so anyway, so we've got our folders here and, you know, there's one on bibliographic records. And so that's, I can now look at this report and run it, or I can take this report. I'm not going to try to clone it. Um, well, actually that should be simple enough. I'm going to click clone selected template. Now clone in this case means just copy, um, you know, make an exact copy of the template, and then you're able to manipulate it if you want to, or just sort of store it in your own folder. So I'm, it, it prompts me to choose the folder where I want to store this template. Again, these are template folders out of this, this area here. So I'm going to click Chris, and I'm going to say select folder. And then it automatically opens our interface here. Oh, that's interesting. It didn't work. There are no uh, fields or filters here. So this is probably an old enough template that the template upgrader piece just didn't know how to handle it. And that's okay. We, this, is, this is probably 2007 era. We won't worry too much about that. But that's cloning. So cloning, the, the use cases for cloning are, um, I've created a report myself and oops, I forgot to add a field or I made a certain thing wrong. I can clone it, work on the clone. There's no way to go back and like edit the original template. Um, yes, this is a common issue. Some of the older reports just won't make it in. Um, there are some, there, the, I've actually seen the, the Zool upgrader piece do a pretty good job with our stuff, but I, I think it's just a, your mile, mileage will vary with this um, and often, I don't know, I tend to just create new templates, but I, I'm comfortable with this uh, interface in ways that my colleagues ne aren't necessarily so. Um, so, you know, a, a template breaking is not a big problem for me. Okay, um, again, use, use cases for cloning. I created a report, I made a mistake, I can clone the report. That's use case number one. Use case number two is what I just demonstrated. You know that there's a report out there that somebody else has created, and you can then clone that, put it in your own folder. So you, for one thing, it doesn't make you have to go dig for it again. For another thing, you might be like, oh, I'd like to add a field or something like that. Again, in that situation, your mileage may vary, but you know that's a, that, that's a, that's a use case for cloning. Uh, you know, Take somebody else's report, tweak it a little bit, make it your own. Um, and then really just, just making a copy of a report to go somewhere else. Um, when you clone a report, it will add, it'll, it'll populate this template name with the title and the description that was put there, and it will add clone in parentheses to the title. So if we save this and clone this, it'll say clone, clone, and then do that again, it'll say clone, 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 and so on. So, you know, I typically don't let it just say clone, 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 especially for something that I'm gonna show other people. So I might say version two, 
or something like that. Um, so that's, that's cloning. Um, let's see, any questions on cloning? I know that a lot of people have talked in the past about wanting to just directly edit the template in there. I understand that desire, but it's not that big a deal to, to work on the copy and then go delete the old one. It's actually a little safer as far as, um, like if you're a system administrator and you work on configuration files, you always wanna keep a copy of the original. So that way you, you know it's around. So that's one way to look at it. Okay, let's see. Webby will clone, but depending on the filters and fields, they may not display the clone interface correctly. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's not perfect because the cloning, um, the Zool cloning mechanism didn't accommodate every single uh, part. So, all right. Um, so let's, let's look at the interface now. I, we got a peek of it when I ran that uh, clone, when I did the cloning of the report. But let's, let's do a, a full overview of, over it. Um, we're coming up on an hour. I, I do want to work in maybe a five, 10 minute break. Um, let's, let's do that now. Um, so we can, we can ride it on home once we get back in. So let's just say at one o'clock we'll reconvene and I will, um, I will myself take a, a biological break and, you know, get your caffeinated beverage because we're going to um, dive right into template creation right when we get back. So see you in a minute.
So how's everybody doing out there? I mean, you know, in general. I've missed everybody from the conference. It's uh, it's kind of a, I mean, I, I love my house and I love my family, but it's kind of a bummer not to see everybody in person and be somewhere exotic. I mean, it was gonna be at Atlanta, um, but we were gonna be able to stay in the hotel. Sorry, Jessica. <laughs> yeah. This is a wild year for everyone. I, I hope I hope this is all under control next year so we can we can be in um, Kansas City. Yeah, that <clears throat> that is the upside of this is that we've got more participants uh, being able to join. And uh, give, you know, if you've never been to a conference, the sessions look a lot like this. They're just in a fancy hotel bar room or, or something like that. And um, you know, uh, we all you know, go to lunch afterwards or something, but uh, we'll, we'll get to do that again, I'm sure. I'll give people a couple more minutes to get back. Alrighty, to respect everybody's time and try to get through everything we're trying to cover, I'm going to move ahead. All right, um, so again, I got here by going to the folder I'm gonna save my stuff in. We'll just use this training folder, whatever. And there's this link off to the side that says create a new template for this folder. So when I do that, it pulls me into this interface. Um, the, it, it, this, this gets a little hairy, so I, I, I'm going to go bit by bit, uh, and, and introduce it piecemeal because it can get pretty overwhelming if you just dive right in. So you've got your template name, which, you know, we're going to say weeding, you know, basic weeding list. You are required to have a name uh, for this. You were required to have a template description in previous versions. If you're running an older version um, of Evergreen, you may still be required to do that. In more recent 
versions you don't have to. Um, I will mention that I, um, I use the description field to record sort of a breadcrumb style. Let's see where, okay, this is an example of, of what I would put in the uh, template field or the description field. I say what source it comes from. Um, in this case, I had nullability selection. We're not gonna get into nullability today. I think it's just too much to cover for, for a session this short. Um, and then I will show the paths I take, and you'll understand what I mean in a second, to get to the data for both the fields and the filters that I use. And then if there's something to know about the report, I might have a usage note. So that's the way I use description typically. Because sitting and watching me type is super boring, I'm just going to say a very useful description. Documentation URL can be something uh, yes, right? Uh, can be something like pointing to your wiki page or your you know systems documentation. The Pines libraries run uh, we we run that is uh, reports on behalf of the Pines libraries where they want to know how those reports were set up. So we have a sort of dedicated page and we can put that URL in with this. So if they're looking at this report's output, they can click on the documentation URL and it will um, take them where, where they need to go. Uh, there's the save button right up front. Okay. Now we're getting into the more complicated places. Now there is a word called core or there, there's core source, core source, sorry, core source. Um, and that allows you to pick where your data is gonna come from. Now again, with our, uh, our examples before, this is where the core source comes from, is this from, right? If you're, if you're connecting this to an SQL query, this is where we're coming from. And so there's the select source dropdown we're gonna skip this nullability part. That gets pretty, um, it's a pretty subtle idea and I just don't wanna get into it. We can, I'm, I'd be happy to talk, um, talk about it later. Documentation URL is not required, no. You can, you can leave it out. The only thing that's required is template name and then of course, you know, data. Uh, oh, that's a great question. You know, I will show you like, Allison, I, I, I have that in my head, <laughs> so, um, but not everybody does, of course, and not everybody has access to a database, much less their own production database to see what the, the tables are. Um, if somebody can dig up the, the diagrams and put post the link, that would be awesome, but I will, um, otherwise I will get back to those uh, because there, there are there's some reference um, diagrams in the documentation. All right, so, we're going to look at these sources now. Some of these, so it says, first of all, this says core sources. And if you scroll down enough, it'll say non-core sources. So the idea behind core sources is that these are going to be sources that you would use a lot more often. The non-core sources anything else. So as I mentioned in my example about record stores, there's probably gonna be a table that records the transactions between a, a user and the music that they buy, right? A, a customer and the music they buy. And if you just view that table without the context of having the customer information at hand and the music information at hand, all you're gonna get is a big list of numbers, like IDs. And that's really not useful for you to pull reports from. But there are some cases where you want that kind of data. So Evergreen does give you access to basically every table. It's not literally every table in the database, but it's, it's probably most of them. In this case, I'm going to use the item source. And that's one of these. Now, another warning, I don't know what things are like at your system, but we have these classic things. These, are, these were convenience views that were enabled for us. These exist on the list but may not actually exist in um, may not actually exist in 
the database for you. So talk to your system administrator about that if you have questions. Um, so I'm gonna go to item. And so I clicked item here and then all of a sudden this is populated. Yes, that is an important thing to know, Beth, that um, source, source names are not necessarily the same as the table name. For instance, item, the actual table that item is mostly referring to is a table called asset.copy. So underneath everything, everything is called a copy and out in the interface, everything is called an item. Um, just as in the interface, things are called volumes when in the background, things are usually called call numbers. So there's a lot of confusion around the terminology and it's, it's sort of, this is not unique to Evergreen and it's not unique to library software. This is just, you know, how to name things is always uh, a problem in programming. So let's see, item, and it has this little triangle pointing at item. So if I click, if I avoid clicking this triangle and if I click on item itself, this middle pane is populated with some stuff. What do we think this stuff is? If I were to guess, I would guess that that is fields that are available to item. Now, this, is, this, this will illustrate my points that I made in my presentation, because if you look down this list of fields that are available on item and you try to find title or author, you're not gonna find those. They're not there. So we have to go get that information from somewhere else. Um, which we will do in a second. But for now, we can see that they, these are things you know, you know about these things, uh, catalogers do anyway. The active date time is when the copy actually became active as a real copy in Evergreen. Um, hold protection is like, you know, is, is it three months old and we can't put a hold on it outside of a branch or outside of the system, that kind of thing, alert message barcode. I'm not gonna read the whole things to you, but basically, there are all these names of things that you should basically recognize what those are. Some of them may, may be a little confusing, but they're mostly done. And then beside those, you're gonna see these little icons. Um, something I didn't cover, um, this happened the last time I trained reports too, in the original um, setup of this is data types. Um, who can tell me, so okay, first of all, There, a database, this is kind of obvious, a database stores data, right? So you have different things that you're storing. For instance, in our spreadsheet, we've got our ID and we've got our artist and album and, you know, things like that. And you might have, you know, purchase date, something like that. So, and then we put, you know, whatever. Okay, so let's let's pretend that there's that's there, and then purchase price. Okay, so fifteen dollars. Oops. So I know that that's money. So I will go up here and make it money. Okay. So the uh, sorry, I thought somebody chatted a question. Um, this data is different types of data. So Wilco and being there, those are just text, right? That's just like letters. It can be numbers, but it's not supposed to mean a number, right? Uh, you know, Van Halen had an album in the 80s called 5150. Is that, a, is that a, like supposed to be a number that we use in math? No, it's the name of an album. So it's, it's text, right? Plain old text. And the database needs to know what kinds of items are stored in what kinds of fields because it, that's how it needs to work. It needs to know how to retrieve data. Can you search for strings? Can you search for numbers? Can you do math on things? Can you do date math or money math? Things like that. So for instance, the ID is an integer, right? That's a, an integer you may remember from your early math days is a whole number. That's no, no decimal or no fraction, okay? Um, this is, again, these are text, customer, also an integer, uh, you know, a whole number. 
This is a date, which in the database is stored as something called a timestamp. The timestamp gets down to the millisecond as about what sorts of things happen. And we don't think in milliseconds, and most of the time don't need to see milliseconds. So we, you know, everything in the client you're going to see is basically cleaned up so it looks like a real date. It might have the time, um, but probably not all of the, you know, GMT minus four or whatever the, the actual time zone is. And then purchase price. So that's money. And that's not an integer because it has a decimal. Um, so, and money is a type that Evergreen treats its own way. It doesn't really treat it, I mean, it, it, internally to the database, it's just a decimal, but, uh, which is in programming language called a, a floating point number. Um, but in this, we just, we're just going to call it money. Okay, so that's different types of data. Um, another type that we're going to see is Boolean. Uh, you know, Boolean would be, and you know, it gets more complicated than, than this. If you've ever taken a logic course, you know how, how complicated it can get. But Boolean and Evergreen is really just yes or no, true or false, uh, zero or one. It just, that's, that's how it's stored. Um, there is, so money is another type. Um, uh, text is another type. Uh, let's see, timestamp is a type, and um, let me look at my little list here. So yeah, that, that covers most of them. There may be something I'm forgetting. Um, okay, so these little icons actually mean what data type it is, and unfortunately you can't hover over it and really see what it is. So this top one, is active date slash time. So that, that's an indicator that that data is stored as a timestamp. So that icon means something like timestamp. I, I, it's supposed to be a calendar. Um, I've always thought it looked a little more like a telephone or a car battery, but it's, it's a calendar, okay? We're gonna skip this one for a second and move to the Roman letter A, which stands for, you know, text, right? That seems pretty clear. Um, there's a check mark here. So that makes you think maybe of a check box, like nullability here. If it's checked, it's yes. If it's unchecked, it's no. So that would be Boolean. Can circulate, true or false, yes or no. We're going to skip over the little tree here. Um, this little barcode symbol, now this is a, a usability issue, I think. This little barcode symbol actually does not mean barcode. The barcodes are stored as text. So even though they're usually long numbers, they are text. But this is an integer. So if it's got that little barcode looking thing, that means integer. So welcome to Evergreen, folks. Of course, we know a dollar sign means money. Um, and then there's this little scale. Is that what that is? It's going to be a number. Sorry, I'm a little confused. Oh, 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 I know what it is. This is not integer. This is this is ID, which is its own type. Okay, um, it is an integer. It's a parking meter. The symbol for fines. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's supposed to be a scale, actually, like a you know sort of old style scale. Anyway, it means integer. And so fine level here is going to be a one, two, or three. Loan duration will also be a one, two, or three, that kind of thing. Bathroom floor scale, exactly. That's speak. Okay. So those are those are sort of the basic data types. And now I'm going to go back and talk about these other ones. So there's this chain here, and you may have seen something earlier that looked like a chain or was a chain, right? It was this, right? Does anybody remember the point I was making with this chain? Links, yes, okay. All right, so um, about, bar so barcode, barcode is actually not stored as an integer. And that allows you to make a barcode that is not numeric. You can actually just, you know, create a long string that's, you know, whatever, you can use your name or use, you know, random set of characters to be a barcode. 
Um, the database knows its text, so it allows for barcodes to have different types of um, different types of data in there. All right. So barcode is a different type of data than barcode that has A beside it. Let's see, hold on. I'm losing my windows. Okay, so A is beside barcode because barcode is stored as text. So even though it's numbers, it's text, right? If you keep having questions, just feel free to ask them. That's fine. All right, so as we mentioned, links, right? So link, Legend of Zelda again. In this case, why does copy ID have a picture? Oh, well, yeah, that was what I was trying to get to before. It is a usability issue. Um, barcode, this, <laughs> it was a bad choice. They should have chosen a different icon. I'm not even sure what to su suggest, uh, but yeah, that, that, that means ID, and we will talk about what ID means in a minute. It, it is actually a data type, this, this specific, it's not just an integer. Okay, so link, uh, back to our spreadsheet for a second. This points to this, right? So we, we showed that customer ID here inside this music table points to customer ID over here. And we said that that is a foreign key. And it's a foreign key because it's this table's primary key and it's using that to get that data. So this is a link between this and this. So since a link is a number, what do we think age hold protection is? got that link symbol. It's going to be a number. Exactly. Yep, it's a number. So if we report this data out thinking, hey, I'm going to see what the age hold protection is, and you're, you're expecting to see six months. Well, it's not going to say six months. It's going to say two or something, right? So, all right, same with call number volume. There's a link beside that, right? So that again is going to be an ID number for another table. Same with circulation modifier, same with circulation type, same with creating user, floating group. These are all telling you that the data you're after is not here, it is somewhere else, okay? So um, let me talk about IDs. So the ID, as I mentioned, is the primary key for the table. And IDs have what I call magical properties when dealing with um, evergreen reports. And the magic that is brought by ID is that when you use the ID as a filter, and I'll show you this in a second, it will create a nice, selectable, human-readable list of things that you can actually identify when you're running the report. So. We'll, we'll get back to that when we actually get to that point. Okay, circulating library has this little pine tree here. And what that means, it's, that is an organizational unit. Org unit is that type. And what that means is that is a, another, it's got magical properties as well. If you use this as a filter, it should populate your filters when you're running the report with a nice selectable list of the organizational units you can choose from. Okay, so that looks like it. Okay, and I, just a warning, the rain just got really heavy here. It doesn't look like it from my video, but it's very, very dark in this room. So hopefully my power and internet stay up. I'll say a, a quick prayer to the internet gods. Okay, um, all right, so with linkages, now I'm going back over to this little triangle and then I expand that and it's like, oh, what is that? What just happened? And you're like, I quit. And you just say, okay, Chris, I've seen enough. 
I know now that I never want to work in reports. But before you lose all hope, there is a relationship between this link symbol and the presence of something on this list. And there are some linkages over here that aren't in this list, but if there's something here, it's probably going to be available on this list here. So what do we think is going on here? So I, I mentioned the age hold protection. If we reported that field out just as is, that would be just the number. If we click, if we see that it's a link, we can go over here and click age hold protection and then boom, the middle pane just changed. That's interesting. So you can see that it's bolded here. So we know that this, these are the fields that are available here. If I click on aged patron list circulations, same thing, a new set of fields appears, a new set of fields appears. Now what's going on here? What's going on is the item has these links and this is where you can actually go get the data that's linked to the table. So that's what this is. It's not just a confusing mess of jigsaw pieces. This is actually a useful thing. So in the interest of time, I'm just gonna sort of keep going. And um, I have a couple of uh, hints for you that I was putting together in a document uh, that I'll share as well. Um, maybe I'll put it in that same link I sent you earlier. Okay, about paths. So this is, when I talk about paths, and this is my breadcrumbs, right? I showed you my breadcrumbs documentation. I start with item, and then I go to, let's say, um, circulating library. So that's where the item is physically shelved, as opposed to the owning library, which is off call number, See now, uh-oh, <laughs> he has expanded and then he expanded again and I just lost track. Okay, so I just closed it back up. You can click it again and close it. And if you just don't wanna see any of this, you can close that. But we will open it back up because we do wanna see it. Circulating library is where the item is shelved. Call number is the volume. Talk to your cataloger about volumes if this is confusing. The volume has an owner, and that is actually the owning library of the copy, is at the call, at the call number volume level. But it's usually gonna be the same thing in Evergreen. They divided this out when they were designing the software so that you could have a collection that's owned by headquarters and maybe gets shelved at Bookmobile or gets shelved at temporary collection over here, still owned by the main library, but has a, uh, a different actual physical place. So that's what that is. But we'll, we'll just say circulating library. So we're gonna create a report now. What we wanna see is the library name, and in this case, I'm gonna choose the short name. This is like the policy code. In Pines, we use these like it'll be, you know, ARL-ATH for the Athens Regional Library, Athens Branch. Um, so I'm going to say, gosh, the rain is getting really heavy. Um, so what I did here is I clicked on short policy name and that lit up bold and I clicked add fields and then that's here. And by the way, these are tabs. So I'm on the display field tab. So this is going to show us what we want to see. Okay, so we want to see the library name in our report. So since I don't like the fact that that says short policy name, I can right click, click change column label. And that will let me say circulation, or I'll just say circ library, okay? Now, I just changed the name of that. So when I come back later and I look at this report, how am I gonna know that I called it circ library? What is, what is circ library? Where'd that come from? Well, that's where the breadcrumbs documentation comes in, in handy. At this point, as I'm creating a report, I have another text window open, like the one I showed you a second ago, that has me saying, okay, item, arrow, circulating library, 
arrow, short policy name as circ library. That way I know that I renamed that field circ library and it's actually short policy name. Just advice. Okay, so we wanna see the library. Um, we wanna see where this thing is shelved. So we're still, we're still on the main thing of the item and we're gonna look at the shelving location. Now again, if we look at item, we'll see shelving location here, but remember it's a link. So we don't want that because it's a number. So we're gonna go down here and click on shelving location so we can get that, that data we actually want out of here. And what we want is the name of the shelving location. So I'm gonna click on name, which makes it bold, and I'm gonna click add fields. And now I've got this field down here called name. Once again, I have to rename that to something useful. So I'm going to change column label again, and I'm gonna call that shelving location. All right, now, so I now have my circle library, my shelving location. When I create item lists or weeding lists or whatever we're doing, I assume that the goal is to physically locate the item in a, in a physical location. Um, and so I start with the library and then I go to the shelving location, then I go to the call number, and then I'll add, have the barcode listed on there as well, title, author, barcode. That's, that's just sort of what we're, what we're gonna do here. So, circle library, shelving location. Uh, the next thing is the actual call number. Now, we look on item and we see call number slash volume, but we see it's a link. So again, that's a number, but it's not a call number, right? It's a link to this call number volume table. I will look for the field. I know that it's called call num number label. I will add fields. I don't like call number label as, a, as actually what it's called because nobody knows what that means. So I'll just shorten that to call number. Okay, circle library, shelving location, call number. So we're, we're getting closer. Now, I think at this point, if you were looking, if, if you handed this to me and I was, I'm running out to the shelves to grab something, so I find it helpful to display the column, column. Oh, so see, you learn something every day. So I'm gonna click on column here. Hey, very nice. So Beth Willis just taught me something, guys. Do the fields show up in order you add them below? Yes, they do. And I'll show you, even there, there, will, there are even more things you can do here, but so let, let me just keep going. Okay, so now, actually it'll be right now. So now I wanna put some bib information in here. I want the title and author, right? Because you need to have that. So I'm going to, I know this because I know the database structure. So this is something you're gonna just wanna memorize. It goes from item, to call number volume, to bib record, which is attached to the call number. Now cataloger is gonna immediately know this is true, but if you don't work in cataloging, that might be a little confusing. The bib has volumes attached to it, which has items attached to it. That's the relationship. So under bib record, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna click on bib record, I'm gonna expand bib record, and there are more tables here that I can, more sources here that I can grab. And the one that I want is simple record extracts. So that path again, item, call number volume, bib record, simple record extracts. If you don't remember anything else from this training, that will help you if you remember it. Okay, um, here we have title and we have author and we have publication year and all that kind of stuff. So. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I want more than one thing here, so I'm gonna click title. And this matters the order I click it in, author. And let's just say publication year, okay? And I want them in that order. Boom, there they are. Title proper, author, publication year. Okay, I don't like normalized, so give me a second. I don't like that. I design reports so that the person who's gonna end up using them is not mad at me for giving them confusing information. So if they see normalized, and especially since the data isn't normalized anymore, they're gonna be mad at me and I don't want that. So, circ location, shelf, or sorry, circ library, shelving location, call number, title, author, publication year. Now we probably just need the barcode, probably status too, but we're not gonna to get too deep into that. So let's see, barcode, 
is actually on the item itself. So it's up here as we were talking about. So I will click barcode. Um, and remember status is not, uh, there is a status, it's copy status, there it is, but that's a link, so we can't get that yet. All right, so item barcode. Barcode's fine, I don't need to change that. I'll just keep it as is. And it's the only one so far, right? Um, and status. So we have item, copy status. It's right here. And again, it's not going to be a pretty name, so I need to change it. Okay. So this is all right. This will do it. So if I run this report right now, what do I get? Everything. I get all the items. I don't think you want all the items. You want your items. So we need to do some filters. So again, these are tabs. Filters work the same way as, as display fields. You, you select them the same way, but they are tabs. So you click filters and they have slightly different columns and they have slightly different uh, things you can do with them. So this is still lit. And by the way, uh, we haven't talked about transforms yet, but, but we will in a second. Um, any questions so far? I'm always concerned I'm going too fast. I'm also a little worried about the time. I, I want us to actually run a report before this is all said and done. Just keep the questions coming if you've got them. I'm going to keep rolling. Okay, so we're going to want to filter by circulating library. And by the way, if you know you're going to be filtering by something you're also displaying, you know, from the same table, you, you can just go ahead and do this. Now, I talked about the magical properties of organizational unit ID. So I'm going to add that uh, as, and that gets added here. Now, there are a couple of things you have to do to filters because by default, it expects raw data and raw data is whatever's in the database. Like it's just unadulterated data, like whatever's there. You know, I talked about timestamps and stuff like that. That's what it's going to look like in the database. We can do things that clean it up, and that's what's called a transform. That's what's meant by that. Um, it also allows you to do things like counting and things like that, but we don't want to do that, and we don't need to change it for this. Operator is like operators in math. It's like equals or there are others. We will look at the list of what's available to us. We have equals and contains matching string and substring and greater than and greater than and equal to, et cetera, et cetera, F, et cetera. And in this case, we only care about in lists. So what this is gonna do is create a nice selectable list of all of our org units that we can choose from, okay? All right, so that's one. So if I run this report right now, what do I get? Everything inside that whatever org units I select. That's probably not what we want because for one thing, this is not filtering out whether or not the item is deleted, okay? So fortunately, item has this is deleted field. It's a Boolean. Remember that Boolean is true, false. So that little check mark. So I'm gonna add is deleted and I want it to change. I can change this value and this is called hard coding this. I can change it here. I'm going ahead and it's setting it in the template so I don't have to set it later. So when I click that, and it depends there on older versions of Evergreen, it actually has you type true or type false, which is same thing. In this newer version it has, this is master, it has this. So deleted equals false. Now this is one of those things where you want to do this right now and not have your people running the reports going, why is all this deleted stuff on my report? You also don't want them to have to pick deleted true or false. Again, your goal is to give them data and make it easy, not have them. Okay, so right now, if we run this report, it gives us all items that the libraries we selected that are not deleted. Again, that's probably not narrow enough for a real library situation. So it's probably a good idea to use our shelving location. 
and let's just do this. This is a, a weeding list, right? This is what you hand to your staff member who's on Facebook too much or whatever, and you just want them to go do something. You're like, here, okay, you run this report and you hand it to them. So we want buy shelving location. So I, I clicked on shelving location, which is off item, right? Item, shelving location. And then I will put the shelving location. I'm tempted to put name because then you can type in the name, but you don't want to do that. You're going to click ID. Okay, and that seems weird, but remember it has a magical property. That magical property is that you can create a selectable list. Um, in this case, I will also choose the in list operator. Okay. All right. So it's going to display circ library, shelving location, call number, title, author, publication year, barcode, and status. It's going to be filtered by circulating library, um, whether it's deleted or not. And it's, it is not. We've gone ahead and said it's not deleted. And it's going to be by the shelving location. OK, I think we're ready. And I'm just going to say save template. Okay. Possible to filter by last CERC date. Basic, it is possible to filter by anything you see, basically. Um, whether it's doing really what you want or not is a, is, is a matter of experimentation sometimes. So it, this, the, the upside to all of the sort of complexity of all of this is that you can get extremely fine grained about this. I, you know, our cataloging staff at GPLS often asks me to do specialized reports that get deep into the MARC record. So you can do all kinds of things with reports. We're keeping it very simple today because we only have a limited amount of time. And it's, uh, you know, it, we're really just talking about how do you use this in the first place. So I created a template. It's under my training folder. And now this exists here, OK? It's got my documentation link. If I click that, it's going to open in a new window, whatever URL I put in there. Now I put the times thing, and I'm logged in. So it's got this weird catalog view. Okay, so to, again, like we did at the beginning, we will select the report on the list. Uh, by the way, you can also delete or move reports to other folders. Um, in this case, we want the default from the report. Click Submit. Uh, I am going to create this report. It's called Weeding List. I want it stored in the training folder. Um, now, what organizational units do we want? See, it's got a nice list that I can select. By default, it selects whatever library I'm logged in as. I'm logged in as BR1 here, and this will be whatever library you're logged in as. So I'm, I want BR1, and then it shows you the different uh, shelving locations. Now, it's interesting because there's some that are the same. So that's, that's interesting to me. I don't know why that's true. Anyway, so let's say I want audio, video, and biography, which is probably not right. But let's say they're right next to each other in the library. This makes sense for some reason. So I selected those. And by the way, I, I did a, you can do a shift click, or you can do control click to, to uh, pick, you know, cherry pick them. So that's, that's what I'm using there to do that, to pick more than one. Um, or you can add them one at a time. You can select there and delete, whatever you want to do. So that's the way that works. So we're going to run this. You can see that it says item is deleted equals F. That's a little tiny little F there. So that's the hard coded filter that I put in there. That way I don't have to select this every time. If I'd left that undone, it would make me choose yes or no, which again would make someone mad. So I'm going to choose my output folder of training. I want, I'm just going to leave these defaults. Um, Yes, control A will select the whole list. So yeah, it's good for you to just sort of learn basic browser skills like that uh, to, to use this stuff. Um, okay, we want it to run as soon as possible. We don't want to recur. We want it to go to my email address. I, I don't think this is actually set up to email out, so that's all right. Uh, so save report. Okay, so action, action succeeded. So what happens now is it sitting there in pending items? 
Yes. And it completed. So it ran. Hooray! Reports works. Um, so you saw it in pending a second ago, and it ended up in completed. Uh, if this were a recurring report, it would be in pending with the next runtime. It would look just like this, and it would have the runtime set there for the next run. Okay. So I am going to click beside this view report output. It opens my new pop up here. Uh, you can see useful description here. It's got my external template link that goes to our catalog, but it could be whatever. Uh, tabular output. The bar chart didn't generate anything, but here's our list, our beautiful list. So you'll notice that it's sorted the way we probably want it to by circ library, shelving location, call number, title, author, etc. And that's an important point. It will sort left to right based on the up to down selection of fields. Um, so that's our report. And again, it's showing the status. I could have, I could have uh, done something where it was only showing available. That would actually make way more sense for a weeding list, available or real free shelving or something. In this case, I just didn't think of that because I'm just going for an example. All right. So there's our list and you can see that there's this, uh, looks like some of our, uh, you know, this is actually a bug since we um, don't normalize the titles and authors and all that stuff anymore. It doesn't, this particular generated HTML doesn't know Unicode apparently, so that's why all that stuff's there. Um, back, also known as diacritics if you're a cataloger. Um, okay, so again, I can download that in Excel and do kind of cool stuff with it. Now, I wanted to look really quick at the debugging info just to give you a, an idea of what's there. We're going to have to end in a minute. Um, to allow for the next group. I also have another appointment at, uh, at two that I did not cancel. So the most important thing I wanted to show you here was this generation generated SQL, okay? That should look familiar to you. You've got select from where, and then you've got your, you know, group by and order by sort of specified there. Um, even though it's got these ugly, ugly names here for the tables, this, this is actually pretty readable. Like what I do when somebody asks me to troubleshoot a report is I'll copy and paste this into a text editor and I will do a find and replace of all of these field, uh, all of these um, table names and then it's suddenly readable, I can see it. And it is something I can make sense of. And often the problem is here in the joining and we didn't have a chance today to get into the specifics of how joins work you know, inner join versus left outer versus whatever, um, right join, all that kind of stuff. Um, that gets into nullability, which is another issue. Um, but that is walking through template creation. Um, I think that's as far as we can go. I did want to point you to the Evergreen documentation, which will reinforce a lot of the stuff that we talked about today. This is for Looks like the last version of this was for 3.2. This is a, a good segue for Blake's session, which is next about uh, mTOR documentation, um, because that's the transitioning. But right now, this is the old style ASCII doc uh, documentation. Um, but this part 12 of the admin section is reports. And it's got a lot of the information, including you see the data types there, uh, how transforms work, all that kind of stuff is right here. Um, so, any questions? I'll open the floor to Q&A. You can put it in chat or you can unmute, either way. Oops. Okay. Best organization practice for admins to develop templates, et cetera, for users. I'm so glad you asked that because one of the things that Pines did that I think is a mistake um, is that our consortium, okay, all right. By the way, I just added some documentation to the end of that um, document I shared with you at the beginning that shows you the common sort of paths and some of which we went through today. Um, I, I may, uh, if I get some time, I'll, I'll even add to that. I'll add things about holds and transits and things like that. Uh, let's see. So reporting isolates siloed between users, including admins. Somebody needs help with theirs. They have to mess around. Sharing. This is all stuff that we dealt with. Um, 
yes, you, you, you can share whatever you want that I've created. Um, yes, it's, it's public on the web and I'm, I'm good with sharing anything here. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I don't think I sent my slides to anybody, but I, I, I'm happy to share those as well. I, I don't know how useful they are out of context, but um, anyway. Um, anyway, one of, the, one of the things Pines did, I think wrong, was they just sort of said, okay, go at it, and had a big free for all. And it created a giant administrative mess that we're still cleaning up a long time later. And you know, there's reports running out there that God knows if they're right or not, but they're getting reported and they're getting reported to boards and things like that. So I, I would, um, personally, we, we've taken a tighter control over reports. Um, we also implemented a feature called Quick Reports that you may have heard of um, that worked really well for us. It was developed by Emerald Data Networks and it's got a, um, it's basically a PHP interface that lets you um, just run a bunch of canned reports and not worry about all the stuff we just talked about. But really what I would suggest to the administrators, and if you're an administrator on this call, is to take this part on as much as possible. Like, in your, like if you're in the administrative office for a consortium or something, just take it on the responsibility of creating a core set of templates and making them public in the sort of shared template way that you saw um, Pines doing. When we started doing that, we, we, we were able to reduce the number of specific reports requests a lot. Um, because that, you know, every library thinks they're a snowflake and that we're you know, very different and whatever. But what we found with quick reports being sort of the canned reports model, almost all of them just need the same stuff. Um, you know, we, we do get a number of reports requests throughout the week, but it's not, it's not too bad. Um, okay, yeah, Jeremiah, that, that is definitely an approach you can take to, um, like, write your own in the background. Uh, you know, there's, there's another library. I don't know if Jeff Godin's in the audience or not, but he, he's at Traverse Area District Library, and he uses Jasper Reports, which is sort of an open source alternative to crystal reports, which is, uh, you know, sort of generate a PDF from a database or something like that. So, you know, there, there are lots of ways people do, deal with it. I guess remembering that it's just a Postgres database and whatever helps you get the data you need is, is what you need. But, you know, this is a built-in tool. It is very powerful. It is designed to do what, you know, librarians wanted, even though it's, you know, too complex in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. So I, I would advise against a lot of sort of free-for-all sharing of templates across uh, libraries because uh, I'm not saying this in response to Benjamin. I'm just saying in Pines, that didn't work well for us um, because we did, it, it lets an incompetent person share a not very well-constructed report and result in bad data. And given the number of budget cuts we're all looking at right now, from you know lost revenue and everything, you want those numbers to be as right as possible. You don't want to have to issue corrections or have them be too low or crazy inflated or something like that. So accuracy is really important right now. Yes, yes, the ones you create share away. And that's what I say to our libraries. The ones that I put in my shared account, and I, you know, we sort of have them personalized, like I have a shared account, a shared folder. Taryn has a shared folder. Don has a shared folder. It probably wouldn't make more sense to have a single shared folder, but we um, we will. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. The um, oh, I always say the ones in mine, I can vouch for as far as they did work when I created them. And that, that's all I can say. Like I said, reports change. You know, the ones from 2007, I probably wouldn't put a lot of stock in. The ones from 2013, I probably wouldn't put a lot of stock in, even if I created them. Um, you know, I, I would probably try to recreate them in the web client. You saw that the Zool converter doesn't always do its job, so. Okay. All right, I think we should clear the room for the next folks, right, Amy? Yes, uh, yes, Chris, excellent, as always. Thank you. <laughs>